Um, thank you for the opportunity to um, present to you um, an overview of prevention options for women. Let me see how that works. This right here? Have to like be insistent. Yes, okay. <laughs> so um, I think you're probably very familiar from the previous speakers about the risk that um, particularly young women and adolescent girls face um, in sub Saharan Africa, um, as well as the fact that they tend to acquire HIV five to seven years earlier than their, their male peers. And most of my talk will be focused on. Um, trials and studies in this um, population of young women. Um, you probably also are familiar with the uh, low adherence that uh, we noted in um, several of the large trials that involve, uh, prevention trials that involve women, Voice, Femme Prep, Facts, and Aspire, where um, we learned that actually it's um, not so easy to engage uh, these young women into um, high adherence for in prevention trial and um, sort of highlighted the importance of engaging them early as a user in the product development pipeline. Um, so I think that um, one important um, lesson we've learned is that um, research with potential users should start at the preclinical or the ideation stage and continue during the development stage um, through clinical trials and persist through the implementation and rollout stage. And I'll show you some highlights of um, these different stages. It's also important to remember that a, a, a successful prevention product doesn't just um, entail an efficacious drug in a delivery system, but also an efficient user and we have to focus on them. And then I hope to convince you that uh, what is really important is to provide choice, because choice is an important strategy to improve um, coverage of HIV prevention option among women. So let's go back for a second to the contraceptive world. And there was a systematic review conducted by the WHO. You can see a graph, an aggregate graph on, on the right, um, showing that uh, there was a 12% increase in contraceptive prevalence for each additional method added to the contraceptive toolbox of that country. So we actually should not say what is the best method to roll out for PrEP, but how many methods can we roll out so that we have a better coverage? Just a reminder here of, um, this is a slide from uh, um, AVAC that shows the relationship between um, the effectiveness of the product and um, the level of use of the product um, for oral prep um, as well as topical prep uh, for tenofovir-based tenofovir product in this very uh, clear linear relationship. I added, in addition to the um, uh, full dots that show the different trials, um, little rings to show that we saw similar, similarly a relationship between use and effectiveness in the vaginal ring trials that I will talk to you a little bit about as well. Um, going from the phase three trial ASPIRE and the ring that showed modest protection around 30%. Um, increased protection in the open label uh, trial HOPE over 30% um, and then the DREAM trial um, conducted by IPM uh, which showed uh, more than 60% protection overall and an estimation of 95% of the women using the ring. So now I want to go back also to the challenge we have with oral PrEP and a daily method. And this is a slide I borrowed from Jordan um, Kiongo from IAS 2018 showing um, the challenge with persisting with PrEP in different population, female sex worker, men who have sex with men, as well as young women. So it is not specific to young women. The challenge with persistence and adherence, it happens in all population. So let's go back to the issue of choice. More options uh, results in better choices, increased coverage, and ultimately higher impact. 
I want to move back now to um, product development pipeline framework thinking about product from the discovery stage, development, and delivery stage. And the rest of my presentation will highlight some products and um, uh, at the early stage of the discovery, followed by um, uh, discussion of clinical trials where we um, collected information about any user during clinical trials at the development stage, and then finally the delivery stage. So let's start with the discovery stage. Um, I will actually bring in uh, the concept of multipurpose technology. These are two-in-one products that um, may protect from more than one um, disease. Um, I'll focus on HIV and unplanned pregnancy. They are um, um, the same route of administration or the same route, the, the same route of exposure. Um, and therefore protection um, using a product for both pregnancy and HIV makes sense for a lot of women. And they are also earlier in the product pipeline stage, so I thought they would be a good example to show. So I'm starting with an ongoing um, study conducted by the micro in, within the microbicide trial network called CUPID, and it enrolls 400 couples uh, in Uganda and Zimbabwe. I want to draw your attention to an informational video on the right, far right, of, um, where we actually introduce the concept of uh, the product development pipeline. I think it's important for participants to understand that when we come early in the development stage of the product, there will be many years before they see this product coming to their uh, community and um, sort of um, conveying this importance of engaging them early, but also managing expectation that it may take 10 years before the product, product comes out is important. So this video is explaining this product pipeline, uh, making a similarity with going to school. The product starts in kindergarten, and then by the time it graduates, there's been 12 years. <laughs> so it's, it sort of gives the time scale. In this particular study, which is ongoing, we will evaluate four delivery, delivery form, a vaginal ring, um, a vaginal film, a vaginal insert, and an oral, a daily oral tablet. And we use um, a, a technique, use discrete choice experiment to uh, understand trade-offs and preference between different attributes of the product. There's also an exercise that couples do together to highlight their ideal product. And this is an example from a Ugandan couple who um, chose um, as their preferred delivery form a vaginal insert, wanted this to be uh, used pr uh, before sex, wanted to have only side effects that affected, um, that um, caused headaches, minimum effect on the menstrual cycle, no change in the vagina during sex, uh, immediate return to fertility after stopping the product, and systemic protection. Um, I'm talking now about another product that is currently on development a little further along. Um, it is in preclinical stage, and it's a, a biodegradable implant that has an MPT indication. My colleague Alice Lee will be presenting a poster on Monday about this, uh, this implant. And some of the advantage of the implant is, first, it looks like um, a contraceptive implant. It's used the same uh, applicator system. It has constant release over time of the drug or of the two drugs, as opposed to a first order release or the uh, familiar PK variation from a neural product. We also asked end user their opinion about attributes of the implant to help inform the product development. You can see on the top, that was the generation one of our product, which um, was almost looking a little bit like a Ziploc bag. People didn't like that. The membrane was too thin. The flat, flappy ending didn't look very um, professional. And we made a number of changes that were also um, informed by scaling up and fabrication to a, a rod-shaped device that um, fits with the Sino2 implant trocar. 
Um, we also ask uh, participants what they liked, in what they prefer in terms of the duration of the implant. And what you can see here is that not everybody likes longer duration. Three years is in purple. So what you can see is among nulliparous women, the majority actually like less than two years for an, an MPT implant. Now let's move on to the development stage. And I'm going to uh, show quickly findings from two trials that um, uh, looked at long-acting injectable. This one was uh, the long-acting injectable repelvirine, which has not uh, moved forward into phase three. But what you can see is that in general, acceptability from the end user perspective was very, very high. The only area where there was a little lower acceptability was for pain, but only a subset of the women who were engaged in this trial um, experienced pain with the repilverine long-acting. Now moving on to HPTN 077, which is a trial of the cabotegravir long-acting um, injectable. It is now in phase three trial, both in MSM and in, um, in women. And what you can see here is even though there was fewer injection, the injection is more painful. And the one um, attribute of the injection that seems to provide, to have less enthusiasm for was the pain on the injection site. Nevertheless, it's highly acceptable. Um, the researcher also asked hypothetical preference for injection compared to other methods at the end line, at the end of HPTN 077, the green, the grass green is the uh, proportion or percentage of participants who like injection best. You can see it's overwhelming, um, more so in the non-US setting than in the US setting. And this is not just women, by the way, it was women and men, um, they presented the data uh, aggregated. So injectables are very much like. Now let's um, talk about a couple of um, um, uh, studies that are more on the delivery end. Ooh, sorry. How do you go uh, back? There we go. So this was a trial, oral prep trial conducted um, in South Africa called 3P with 200 uh, adolescent girls and young women. Um, in around Cape Town. And women were randomized to an incentive arm where they received their drug level feedback, as well as an incentive, it, it was over 700 um, femtomol per punch on their dry blood spots, which is um, equivalent to high protection and, high, and consistent use of the product. And um, the standard arm who just received the feedback, the drug level feedback, but no incentive. What I'm trying to show here is um, trying, you know, an intervention to motivate um, a high adherence wasn't particularly successful. Uh, at three months, there was a difference between the incentive and the standard arm, but it was not significant. And still, we had less than half of the participant who managed to keep that um, high level of use, and then it dropped pretty precipitously over time um, to month 12, at less than 5%. So it's challenging. We need to continue to try to find ways to support and motivate adherence. And so I would like to end with the last trial, which is giving us quite a bit of hope, I think. And this is the REACH trial. Um, it's also an, M an MTN trial. And in this trial, um, adolescent girls and young women will be randomized, it's a crossover study, to six months of pill use, six months of um, a vaginal ring use, or the opposite. They can then choose the product they like, and then they can continue to use their favorite product. So this um, uh, trial is ongoing. Uh, one important, mm -mm. ooh, it is tricky. So one important um, uh, component is that there's also a lot of support, including an adherence support menu, um, and young women can choose uh, which adherence support approach would match best their need at that time. So there's a lot of choice and a lot of support to choose. We use a simple way of conveying uh, drug level 
um, with a Wi-Fi signal that everybody um, find easy to understand. And then the results here are still grayed out because this, the trial is um, ongoing. But what I can say is um, compared to the pills, which are the four, the oral pill in different trials that are um, the four first bar where you could see a lot, you can see a lot of below level of quantification um, among the participant. In reach, in the pill group, it's looking really good. And then when you move to the next uh, bar, which is ring use um, in the open label extension trial HOPE among women less than 25. Again, I can't show you the results, but it's looking really good too. So young women are able to adhere. You just have to give them the support infrastructure and package to be able to use this product. So I want to finish with a busy slide. It's my scorecard about the different products. Um, the different products are listed on, as a row from condoms and daily pills that are approved, on-demand microbicides that are uh, being developed, vaginal ring which is um, in, um, waiting for regulatory approval, injectable in phase three, and implants that I have started phase one trial. And then vertically is a number of attributes um, that I thought were important. I think the lesson from here, there's no perfect product. Every product has pros and cons and people will need to make choice and we need to give them the option for this choice. So I would like to finish my talk with this. And remember that option leads to good, better choice, to better coverage, and to improved impact. Thank you.